He is better known than the bulk of the Collingwood players without ever representing the Magpies on the field. And he's not Eddie. He's Joffa. But who's Joffa? Welcome, Geoffrey Corf. Mike Joffa is a mere underling in your presence. <laughs> Thank you for having Don't me. Don't try to get under my guard. <laughs> I mean, we, we all know you as Joffa, yep. but know precious little about you. What I know is that you're 54. Yeah. You're a welfare worker. Yep, for Salvation Army. Yeah, you grew up in Preston. East Preston. And you were the product of a dysfunctional, dysfunctional family. Yep, very much so. Horribly so. Horribly so? Yep. Um, One of seven kids? Yep. Mum had a variety of uh, mental illnesses in a terrible way. Dad was a bit of a drunk. Uh, in and out of boys' homes. Um, bashed, verbally abused, um, all the things that go on in a family that just doesn't function. Um, so that were the early days. Um, well, you removed yourself from home, did you not, at 14? Oh, I was removed from home by you, mother. Yeah. Yeah, mother had had enough. So uh, on the streets of Melbourne for six, seven months. Were you really? Literally on the streets? Yeah. Laying way beside McDonald's there in Swanston Street and in an old warehouse opposite the Victoria Market where I used to sleep. Gee. And then you went to a Lambie boys' home? Well, the Lambie boys' home, that took place when Mother would be taken to La Ronde Lamont Park for a mental assessment after an episode, a mental health collapse. We would be taken to a Lambie boys' home until she was deemed fit to come back home and look after us. And when she was, we would go back home mm. to East Preston. But, um, you know, six, seven months, you know, she'd try and burn the house down and off to a Lambie we would go again. So, Where was your father? Oh, uh, Dad was, was working. Uh, he was home. He wouldn't stand up or couldn't stand up to Mum. We, we don't know which one it was. Um, he couldn't look after all the kids. He, had to, he, had to, he, was, he worked uh, but, but liked to drink. So, um, you know, if the police um, you know, removed Mum from the home, they also removed us as well. Yeah, you know, the process of doing things mm. might be different today, but back then that's how it was done. Now, I don't know whether this says more about you than me, but you're quite articulate. I mean, well, what was your education like when you were a kid? Well, uh, you know, Bucks asked me the same question um, some time ago. I think um, education, I think, at school is, is pretty basic for everybody to a certain level. I think it's when you leave school, you become educated out on the, on the streets in the suburbs. Uh, that, that's my belief. But can you, t can you learn the language adequately? Oh, I, I, I think so. I, I think you can um, you can learn lots of things as you go through life. Well, we're, I'm still learning today, as probably you are. Um, look, you, you leave school at uh, 14. Um, um, I wasn't much good at school anyway. I, 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 if I was in a functional home, I probably would have left school at 16. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so uh, it's when you get out onto the onto the streets, um, you, you certainly, um, you've got to, you've got to, you, you get educated pretty quickly because it's the, it's a, it's, you, to survive, you, you've got to know what's going on. Were you, were you well adjusted? I mean, that probably, you, you're sleeping on the streets, so obviously yeah. not perfectly, but you obviously seem to carry yourself well and you got through. I remember a Box Hill station hiding in the toilets, crying, not knowing what to do. At what age? 14. 14. Mm. Um, it's very young. I, I, I look at kids today at 14, I look at my own grandkids at 14 and I think, gee, how would they cope in, in the same circumstance? And it's scary. Um, uh, look, I was... Um, you've got to survive. Life is all about survival. You've just got to survive. So you go to where the most crowds are and that is the, the city area because you can hide. You can't hide in the outer suburbs. People will eventually see you or find you, and my mission was not to let the police find me because back in those days, if you were 14 homeless on the streets, you would end up at Beltara, Youth Justice or Tirana, and they weren't very nice places. And to be locked up in one of those places would mean that I wouldn't see Collingwood play uh, every fortnight. So, well, that's true. Well, that, <laughs> that was the motivation, was that it? That was the motivation to keep out of trouble. You kept away from the loud mouths, you kept away from people who were introducing you to drugs. You just kept away from trouble. So you're always looking over your shoulder um, to make sure the police weren't, uh, you know, spotted by the police. Um, and that uh, that lasted for about seven months, that, that, start, that way of living. I did, you, did you need to steal to survive? Oh, of course, you, uh, you stole food. You stole food. Uh, of course you did. 
Um, and that was, uh, that was a, a, an easy thing to do, stealing food. Um, I met up with a guy who was a year older than me and he took me under his wing. We would meet at, the, um, uh, at this building uh, opposite Queen Victoria Market every night to sleep in pairs, mm. in safety. You had to. Being in winter? Young, in, yeah, absolutely. Um, you had to sleep in numbers for safety. Um, uh, one night I get back there, we would meet at this warehouse nine o'clock every night. One night I get back there and there's, there's no steward. Next night there's no steward. Back in those days we didn't have mobile phones. We had telegraph, street telegraph. Mm -hmm. It would get you within two or three days. Uh, word eventually got back to Stuart. He was uh, a year older than me. Uh, he committed suicide in a, in a horrible boarding house thing in, in St Kilda. Um, so that was another, God, you know, what do I do now? You know, uh, uh, there's no mate here. There's mm -hmm. no safety here. Um, so I, you had to pick yourself up again and, and progress with that journey. And uh, that led me into employment where I had to lie to get my first job because of the age, you weren't, weren't allowed to be employed. Uh, 15. So we're talking about 14 and 15. Yeah, yeah. so there was a gap between... 15 was the legal age of hiring somebody back then, so I had to lie to get my first job, and I'm no good at maths, and, I, and I'm trying <laughs> to think, I'm filling out the form. Yeah, um, you know, how old am I? OK, so that, that was fine. I, I, I got all that done, but the problem was, you know, eight, uh, um, eight months later, there was uh, a new details required on forms for they were doing... A, um, yeah, they just issued, they wanted to modernise, I don't know if it was going on the computer or what, but you had to fill in forms again. Of course, I couldn't remember what date of birth I put on the original one, mm. and that was very embarrassing because I thought, well, if they match the, this up to the, the last uh, employment uh, form, they, there's an age, because I, I was no good at maths, so I couldn't figure it out. So I left. I walked out, but in those days, the old situation's vacant sign, uh, and you could walk into mm. another job that afternoon and start the following morning. And of course, the, the next job, I, I, I could be honest about my age, and from then I progressed into boarding houses. What doing in boarding houses? Living in boarding houses. Oh, okay, yeah. Which so you had to place a roof over your head. <laughs> yeah. I don't know which was worse, living on the streets or living in boarding houses. They were very back then. They were, and I, I still think there's a there's a certain amount of danger even today living in boarding houses, but back then boarding houses were the first. Um, uh, place of um, uh, abode for people from prisons. So it was very, there'd be nothing uh, to be sleeping in the middle of the night and the door comes smashing in. Um, and those boarding houses back in the day, you know, you walked into these places and they smelt of faeces and urine mm -hmm. and they, they, they were unkempt and the people were unkempt and it was, uh, it was a struggle, it was a struggle. It's a powerful story and I, and I, I know that firsthand from Scott Pendlebury said that you addressed the, the team mm. um, a couple of months ago during the home and away season. Yep. And Collingwood were getting a, a person in from outside yep. once a week. Yep. Uh, Pendle said that you were the most inspiring of those speakers. So yeah. the th was the theme uh, your growing up period? And, and, and Yeah. yeah. Well, what, what I just spoke about um, to you was, uh, was, was something I mentioned to the players. But my first introduction to Collingwood was from Alambi to Victoria Park because they had a recreation program where people from the public would come in and take kids out for the mm. day. God, you'd never hear of it today. Mm. It just would be a no-no. Well, my name must have been up at the uh, top of the list because uh, the, this young couple come in and took me out for the day and um, ended up in Victoria Park. Mike, you wouldn't believe it. Did you have any football uh, inclination at that point? Well, well, yes, because you used to, as, as very young kids, you used to kick them plastic mm. footy. So mm. you knew what football was and... And here I am at uh, what the, the place was called, Victoria Park. It was, it was probably the first outing in my life. And, and there's Peter McKenna of long black hair, the sun, yeah, ref yeah. the sun reflecting off the back, the plastic number six, surrounded by these wonderful elderly Collingwood ladies who were blue rinsed hair and the turf cigarettes were hanging out the corner. <laughs> yeah, it was a smoker's stand. Yeah. You could smell the liniment coming from the dressing rooms. It was the old member stand. You could smell the hot dogs wooden floorboards and the language. Mm. Wow. Gee whiz, even at that age, you knew what bad language was. Uh, not much has changed in that aspect with the elderly. <laughs> but, Mike, it was, um, it was a coliseum. Uh, it was a coliseum. Vic Park. Oh, yeah. at that age, it was a coliseum. Of course, you know, as you grow up, it was, it was a shoebox. Yeah. It was a shoebox that sometimes you stood ankle deep in mud with, you know, with toilets overflowing down the Arafal's yeah, yeah, end. Yeah. But it was a coliseum. It was, you just, 
there's a guy on the boundary line. He, he waved a white towel to get the Which crowd did too. to get the crowd yeah. going, and and the old ladies would stamp their feet on the floorboards to to generate noise. And I thought, yes, this is me. This mm. is where I belong, and and fell in love with the with the footy club that day, Mike. And look at you now. You're the second biggest name at Collingwood. <laughs> Do you like, do you like the, the, the fame or notoriety that has, has followed you well, in recent years? I, I, <laughs> Look, Mike, it's been a lot of fun, and I don't take all that stuff seriously. True. I don't have an ego problem. I mean, you're big enough now to pick the phone up and, and ring Ed, and Ed take the call. Yeah. I, we, we text each other quite frequently, me and Ed, Yeah. and he always has the decency to reply. He's been very good to me, Ed. I mean, he's always supported me. There, there are times when I, I, I've been in strife with other people at the club, or and Ed is always uh, he rung one night and and said, you know, look, don't worry about it, just move on. This will pass. What sort of strife? Well, there, I, I, there was a picture of me one day in the Herald Sun holding up a shotgun. Oh yeah. All right. Mm. Does that ring bells with you? Well, yes, it does, and and I can understand now that there would be a. Some well, people would be upset by that. Well, the, and and I, I posted it on... <laughs> you know, we're, we're always capable of doing silly things. I think now you think about things a little bit more before you do something. But back then, it was, it was the start of a new football season. I can't remember what year. And I, uh, I had this picture, you know, holding this gun. And I, I posted it on a Collingwood fan site bulletin board bring on the new season and there I am holding mm. <laughs> bring them on we're ready fun and it, co- it created a big uproar with, um, who, with whom oh uh, uh, the media and the shotgun lobbies and, and Collingwood oh uh, yeah you've certain people at Collingwood yeah. certain people at Collingwood didn't like it but Mike we are, everything was was legal the, the cabinet had two locks the shotgun wasn't loaded it was a fun hey bring on the season it was Where just the image yeah yeah just yeah. the image yeah, yeah. Did you did you um, have a falling out with Bucks over some over something in the papers or some uh, um, some behaviour? Oh, I, I, I was um, one day. Travis Clark was having a shot at goal in Footscray Collars, and uh, I didn't know the cameras were on me. If I had known they were on me, I probably would have pulled up a bit. You know they're on you. They're on you. No, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know when they're on you. I, I, so what you, you were mouthing him off over the fence, were you, or, or doing worse? Oh yeah, well there was a bit of language involved, you know. I, um, and they barrelled up Bucks about this at the press conference, and I was really embarrassed for Bucks, you know. I, I really felt bad, and I, I, I uh, uh, sometimes I sit at the football, and I think to myself, Joff, don't move, because what are you <laughs> do? It's, it's going to be screwed. That passes, doesn't it? That oh, oh yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Every time I get to the football, I, I, I sit in the car, and I give myself a talking to. I say, Joff, grow up. Act your age, it's just a game of football. Just sit down and enjoy the game. When it finishes, go home. And then you grab your gold jacket, yes. <laughs> put it in your bag and go in. Yes, and then I, I, I think I, the record was six minute mark in the first quarter. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Sounds like a, a song title, that. <laughs> Zaha Ruckus <laughs> in the rain. God, so, God. so Rock has kicked the goal. Well, well, he's kicked the goal, and out's come the goal jacket, and we're celebrating, and all of a sudden someone says, sit down, sit down. The umpire's taken the goal away, and there's a 50 metre penalty against Rocker. Essendon get a goal. Oh, dear. Mm. There's two, three minutes to go with only 11, 12 points of difference. Zaha Ruckus kicked a goal. And, oh, God, how much time to go here? Now, oh, there's, there's, there's one and a half minutes to go and Essendon have just got to get the next goal. And, and they're home uh, and they do and the siren goes and there's me in the gold jacket. Bit crestfallen? Well, I've just told people, quick, stand around me. <laughs> I'm going to crouch down behind the seats and get this thing off. <laughs> Pretend that... <laughs> Is that the only time that it's uh, yes. rebounded Well, on I you? put it on half-time once against Carlton and got in trouble with Eddie. Mm. Did you? Yes, I yeah. did. He gave me a filthy look on his way around the boundary line and instructed me in an email, don't go to early crow. OK. So when Eddie tells you to do something, <laughs> you, you do it. Well, Eddie's linked to that jacket, isn't he? Did he Eddie was... Uh, he, yeah. Didn't he um, give you the original gold jacket? He did, Mike. It was uh, uh, 18, 19 years ago. Uh, he was on the footy show. He's done some sort of an in-house commercial. I don't know what you would call it. But he has done something in this gold jacket. And I was watching it at the time, and I was in... They were the very, very early days. I'm just early contact days with Eddie. And um, I'd contact, uh, I don't know if I, I rang his private uh, secretary, uh, I don't know what they call him, the secretary. His PA, yeah. P, yeah, yeah. yeah personal assistant. Uh, well, I emailed him, but Eddie loved the idea. He said, that is fantastic. And he, he had the, the, the jacket dry cleaned. And I met him at Victoria Park on that Thursday night of training. This is how far back it goes. It was Thursday night training at Victoria Park. He had it dry cleaned. It was still in the, in the, in the, in the wrap, in the dry cleaning wrap. Um, it was a, a jacket from the Channel Line wardrobe. In fact, yeah. Bernard King once wore it. Tommy Hanlon Jr. once wore it. So there's a bit of history of this thing. Mm. So it started to get ragged after a couple of years. So I thought, you know, I, I, we've got to look after this thing. So it's framed now, that particular jacket, that early, that original gold jacket. And he's now hanging up at the, um, at the Holden Centre. Mm-hmm. Uh, each year we get a new jacket and we just, uh, after the season, we auction the, the jacket off um, for charity. Okay. So the 2010 gold jacket went for under four grand to the Epilepsy Foundation. So you've got a close link with epilepsy, haven't you? My daughter has epilepsy. Mm-hmm. She's you've got three kids? Uh, no, one daughter, four grandchildren. Okay, yeah. We're getting ready to go to football one day um, and uh, this almighty bang crash from the bedroom and race up there to see what's going on. Uh, Emma's on the floor having a seizure. Uh, In my early days of growing up in boarding houses, it was quite common for someone at breakfast time or dinner time to have a seizure at the table. So I knew what it was. I knew it was epilepsy. And uh, Julie diagnosed as as epilepsy. And uh, she's been living with that um, uh, ever since. And um, it's a a battle for people with epilepsy. Mm. I don't think people know how debilitating and cruel this, this this thing is. I mean, you can't lock it up at home and go out for the day. It's with you and you don't know when you're going to have a seizure. I only hope that when she goes down to the beach or goes down to the lake of pool, she tells people, hey, I'm an epileptic, keep an eye out for me. But see, teenagers don't do that because they're embarrassed. How old is she? Oh, she's 34 now. She... So how does, what does she think of her dad's behaviour at the footy? <laughs> Oh, no, she's quite OK. She, um... Uh, <laughs> you would have to ask her. Oh, look, I, um... Look, I'm her dad. I mean, she's got... Who can she compare me to? I'm her yeah. only dad, so... Yeah. Good answer. Is there any jealousy in the cheer squad? I mean, you do get... The right, bulk back, of the, of the, back yeah, in the, the early exposure. Days, back in the early days, it was horrible. Was it? Yeah, when the, when the... The worst thing at the time was, when the gold jacket first came into being noticed was... The internet was getting up and going, social media. And it was really hard to see, to read some of the things that people say about you. Mm, mm. And you sit back and you think, this person doesn't even know me, but mm. he's called me all this horrible... Back then there was no leg to stand on. Today you could take legal action, but back then they got away with it. But you sort of think, wow, is this the sort of people we've got out there where they think they can get onto social media and say this stuff? Is that jealousy, you think? 
Oh. I mean, if they don't know you, what, they've got to be motivated by but, something. But what, what would motivate a person to say ridiculous and outrageous <laughs> and horrible things Not about sure. someone they don't know? You are a fraction brash, though, when uh, Collingwood's winning a game of football, are you not? Well, I'd like to let everyone know when, Colling <laughs> when Collingwood are winning. But, I, I, look, I think, I'm, I, I think I'm calming down in my latter years, Mike. I think I'm... Yeah, look, I'm OK. For a Collingwood supporter, I think I'm all right. Will you be OK? Oh, for a Collingwood supporter? What are you, what are you implying there? <laughs> Not that they're crazy. What will you do like, Saturday? It's crazy. What, we're, it's crazy. We it's crazy, it. yeah. I'm, I'm crazy. Well, you know, what? this is the ultimate accolade for you. They call, uh, occasionally when Ed can go over the top of the football, they call him Joffa in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> are you flattered Tell by that? Tell him to give me the seat with his wallet in it. <laughs> <laughs> What do you got planned for Saturday? Look, if, uh, if the result goes the way you want it, look, we don't. Um, <clears throat> in terms of um, in terms of living, Mike, and, and you're with me here. Well, you might be a bit further down the street to me. In terms of living, <laughs> I've entered the Melbourne Cup straight. Yeah. Okay. So premierships. I'm not going to see a lot more premierships. I'm not. They're so hard to win. Mm -hmm. If we win this one on Saturday. And go back to back next year <laughs> and win the one three, Pete. That's probably it for me. Okay. <laughs> fine, so I'm going to enjoy it. I'm Can we just keep it in the, uh, the current <laughs> period? <laughs> Saturday. What, I mean, what will you do? Have you got, have you got any plans? Oh, look, it'll be a very. Look, this. Look, I tell you, this. I, I, I said to someone the other day, this could be our greatest premiership in this club's history. I mean, the coach was gone a year ago. Mm. The, the playing group, on all accounts, and what you hear, was shredded and gone. Um, gee whiz. They've turned it all around. There are lots of wins along the way. Yeah. Is there any clubs that you particularly like beating? Oh, you know, I'd have to throw Carlton in there, Mike, mm -hmm. but I'd also have to uh, include Melbourne. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. You, you want to what, go back over that answer? Why, why would you, why, why? What happened well, to I'm you? I'm a bit of a blue blood. But why? You like my why? socks? <laughs> Had to meet fire with fire today. You're dicked out in all the Collingwood. And I must say, you look very, very chic. Thank you. Yeah. But why would you barrack for Mel? What, what, what would happen? Well, if you barrack for who your parents barrack for. Imagine how this would be right now if this was a comrade to comrade... In the army, Mike Sheehan, the one-eyed Collingwood supporter, and Joffa. <laughs> Imagine how that would be. We're not in the army, Mick, mate. Mick. We're at the footy. <laughs> <laughs> so you still love beating us, do you? Oh, there's no. The, the, the people forget that Melbourne are a, a, a traditional rival to Collingwood, just as Carlton are. Mate, every time I go to MCG and we play Melbourne, I, I walk through those turnstiles and I'm ready. <laughs> You see him up there in the stand. Righto, that'll do. Like enough for the time. <laughs> now, I know Peter, Peter McKenna was your favourite player when you were young. Yep. Uh, probably when you were a kid. Yes. Yep. Idolised uh, him. Mop Top McKenna yeah. at Vic Park kicking Pop bags of goals. Singer. Yep. Yes. Who's your favourite player? Who's your all time favourite Collingwood player? Oh, yeah, that's a tough question. That's very unfair because we've had so many. Mm -hmm. You know, that's very unfair, Mike, to put me in the spot like that. It's still, maybe still McKenna, is it? You know what? Still side bottom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Phil Carmen. Yeah. I would have to say Phil Carmen is still side bottom. He's this kid from Shepparton, and he's friendly. He's, he's just a great bloke, mm. and what a player! He yeah, he's pivotal to our premiership chance next player. Saturday. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you, you interact with the players? Do you? You know, any occasions when you. The only time I've interacted with them is the, the talk I gave them, which was brilliant. But no. Because sometimes with these younger players, you're in their presence and you don't know what to say. Really? Well, their generation... You. <laughs> you don't know what to say. <laughs> they might be thinking, oh, God, it's him, Joffa. What is... I don't want to be seen to be hanging around the club or hanging mm. around the players. But if the opportunity comes up to meet the players, I shake hands, but I don't know what to say to them. What, what... Are you sort of overawed? Oh, absolutely I am. Yeah. So, yes, of course I am. And... and uh, I think you would be too in with, with Melbourne players. Would you be able? Yeah, no, I, that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Particularly I'm... the old when I, from when I remember back to when I was a kid. Yeah, and watching these, players. yeah, yeah. seeing them now in their seventies and eighties. Yeah, you know, and it's just ah, um, oh, gee whiz, I, 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 I don't know, but uh, you see, I wake up on a Saturday morning and not look 
to go to the football for something to do. Me and many, many others wake up on a Saturday morning uh, and it's, it's a, an inner soul. It's who you are. Mm. It's, this is what I've got to do. I, I become a part of that establishment. I, this is it. Uh, and, and, and you go regardless of what's happening in your life or what, the weather. I mean, God, th th that's not an issue. But how lucky are we to be involved in... Um, I, I can't speak for you and your mob, but <laughs> how lucky am I to be involved in a great club like... Now, don't turn your nose up when I say this, please. Sit there and listen to me. To be involved yes, with a great club like Collingwood. It means everything to me and many of others. I, I'm so lucky in my life to be associated with the Collingwood Football Club, to have some sort of a friendship with Eddie Maguire, to, to go there and talk to the players. My God. When you spoke to the players and, yep. you, and you relived yep. what was a very, very testing upbringing, yep. did you cry? You're in front yeah. of 40 players. Yeah, it's very emotional. Yeah, yeah. So you had to clear your throat sometimes. It's a good lesson for them, though. Look, I mean, they are, they live in a bubble, the footballers. And I think that um, most of these kids to play football today are from um, well-established mm. and credentialed families. And good luck to them. That's OK. Um, they'll probably come from families that are very, very well off. That's OK. That's fine. But I think it's good for these players to know that right now, Mike, right now in the suburbs of Melbourne, there are bills stuck to the refrigerator and they will be there for the next six weeks because people have got to find money to, to pay for finals tickets. They've got to understand this. They've got to understand that people, some people for the next two weeks will be eating pretty ordinary because they're spending all their money on finals tickets. If they can get them. If they can get them. Oh yeah, so it was it was it was good to to tell the place, hey, away from this bubble that you mentioned, there's a very real world out there that's a million miles away from that bubble, and and I work with the Salvation Army. I, I see people for whatever reason fall onto that other side of life and can't get going again through no fault of their own, victims of circumstances, marriage breakup, mm. death in the family. Um, loss of a job can can turn that person into um, the type of person I'm talking about. You, you have some sort of a mental health breakdown, and you and and you and you don't recover. Mm. They're, they're the people I'm with all the time. Joffre, it's a unique story, and you're now a genuine part of the free landscape, whether you like it or not. Uh, I love the fact that we've got to know more about you. I've seen you before and everyone else has, and we'll see a lot of you on Saturday, particularly if Collingwood win the grand final, uh, and I hope you get to enjoy your moment. Very nice words, Michael, and I'm still an underling in your Shake great presence. Shake my hands. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Joffa.